Welcome, everyone, to the Believe in Bingo podcast with Solomon Wilcox. And right now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Cincinnati Bengals assistant head coach and special teams coordinator, Darren Simmons. Coach, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. So thanks for having me on. It's a, it's a great joy for me to be on here with you. Well, it's, it's been far too long, and we've yeah. been sort of um, getting a lot of our viewers asking to meet a lot of the Cincinnati Bengals coaches and and, you know, you've been at it for a long time, 21 seasons. You're entering your 21st season with the Cincinnati Bengals, 26 in all in the National Football League. You've been through, what, seven defensive coordinators in Cincinnati, <laughs> I think six offensive coordinators. To what do you maybe attribute to your success and your longevity in the league? Well, I just keep fooling them. That's all I do. I just, <laughs> I just keep fooling them. No, you know, I, I've been very, very, very fortunate. We've uh, I've worked for two very good head coaches. That's the common denominator, I think. I've worked for two very good head coaches, um, guys who are, are vastly different. And, and I think I uh, mesh well with them. And, and uh, you know, I, I try to work with them what they want, first and foremost. To And I try to change my approach and some of my vision to what they want. You know, uh, I still have certain things that, that are foundational beliefs for me that I try to stick through. But um, you know, I, I think I've, we've been around quality people that we've had here um, in this coaching staff and in this organization is a big part of it. We know continuity is is a is a huge thing for this organization. And uh, I think we're finally starting to feel the the fruits and, and the labors and the, the benefit of that. So um, I've, I've just been fortunate to be around really, really, really good people. Well, you made a name for yourself as one of the best special teams coordinators uh, in the National Football League. And it all goes back, I guess, to Dodge City, Kansas Community oh, College. My good friend and colleague at CBS Sports, Steve Tasker, one of the best special team players in NFL history, began um, at Dodge City Community College before he went on to Northwestern. So, so what is it about that program or Dodge City? Is there something in the water? What what gives? <laughs> well, actually, Steve, he grew up in, in, a, in a small town called Leota, which is in the same conference that uh, my my high school team is. So it, it's very rural. It's it's uh, farming is by far the number one industry there. So, you know, you, you come from a lot of hardworking families and, and hard, hard, hardworking people. And and I believe that's where I, I got my work ethic from my family, my, my, dad, my parents. And uh, I'm sure Steve feels the same way. Um, but but they're really good, hard, tough people out there who uh, uh, who work for everything that they get. And and that's kind of what you demand of the players that uh, that you have on your special teams unit and have done so for so far so long. I want to start with one of the the best kickers that you've had. You got a pretty good one now, but I want to go back to just your tenure as we look back. A guy like Shane Graham, who became an an All Pro under you, or or even a great punter. Um, like Kevin Huber, uh, who went to multiple Pro Bowls. Um, what is it about kickers and punters that you kind of look for as you help to develop them that helps you to believe that these are the kind of guys I'm looking for at those unique positions? Well, I, I think I have an advantage over most special teams coaches, Solly, because I, I, I played the position. I was a quarterback and a punter in, in college. Uh, I was a punter as an average quarterback. I was a starting punter, but I was just an average quarterback. Um so I understand a lot about the technique and I understand a lot about what it should look like. Um, and, you know, first of all, with going with Shane, Shane was a, a player that we had had when I was with the Carolina Panthers the year before I came here in 2002. Our, our kicker was John Casey. Um, you may remember that name. He yeah. got injured and uh, shot, uh, Shane came in and filled in for him for um, toward the last half of the season, did a good job for us. And, you know, unfortunately, my first year here, our, our kicker was Neil Rackers, who got hurt in training camp. And Shane became available. He lost a training camp competition with John Casey. So we acquired him. And, uh, uh, you know, he did, a, he did a really good job. And Shane, Shane was a, a good, solid kicker coming out of college. He just never kicked off. They had a punter at Virginia Tech that kicked off. And, and I, I knew Shane was an accurate kicker. And, uh, but he really developed his kickoff leg in his time here. And, and in some of that time, we were even kicking off back at the 30-yard line. So, wow. um, you know, it, it was a little different then. Um but, you know, I think the one thing you got to have is, is a certain level of, of mental toughness, especially playing in this division. Um, you know, the different weather patterns, weather conditions we're going to play in. We play in tough places like like Cleveland. When you play in Cleveland yeah. in December, when you play in Pittsburgh late in the season, even when you play in Baltimore late in the season, those are all very, very, very difficult places to play. And, you know, quite frankly, when you get a bunch of guys that are from southern climates, 
you know, and I know that sounds a little bit full pies because we got the one we got, the kicker we got now is from that climate. But That's right. um, I think guys who've never kicked in this climate have a tougher job, a tougher um, feel to get going with it. So, you know, a lot of the guys we've had historically have been, you know, really from around this area, been Midwestern people um, that they've played in these conditions um, their whole life, whether it be high school, whether it be college, even, you know, even some of their, their pro tenures have, have been in this area, guys we've acquired. So they got to be mentally tough. They got to know how to handle the wind and ha- how to handle the conditions and then, you know, kick in, in tough spots, you know, dating back. And I'm kind of dating myself here. This is when I first got here back in 2003, this was like the called the black and blue division where it was That's a right. ground and pound. And, you know, you're trying to stop guys like, you know, Jamal Lewis in Baltimore and, and uh, Jerome Bettis in Pittsburgh. And, and so possessions were limited at that time. And, and, so every kick that you made, you know, field position was such a huge, huge factor. So we had to do we had to do a really good job every time we had the opportunity to score points. We scored points, and uh, Shane was one of those guys that did that. You know, then later on in my time here, we got Kevin Huber. I, I feel very fortunate to be a part of his career and, and his time here. Um, you know, I, I think the the one thing that's really really unique about him is how consistent he was. You know, yes. over his time, and he never really lost his games. He won his games. Um, but we always knew what we were going to get, you know, not only from a, a consistency standpoint with him, but but also from a, a reliability standpoint. He was always he was a good uh, punter for us in the plus 50, did a good job of controlling field position. Mm-hmm. Um, he was able to uh, you know, he went through a, a variety of kickers, too, in his time here holding for him. That's that's half his job is being a good holder. And he was an excellent, yeah. excellent holder for us. So, um you know, and working all the way up to Evan McPherson, you know, uh, uh, we got really lucky on Evan. Um, we were on the way that we acquired him, you know, unfortunately for the rest of the world, COVID came in, uh, and in 2021, we got him, the NFL still hadn't let, um, NFL teams, um, have a bunch of private workouts and we did not have a combine in 2021. So right. n- the rest of the league wasn't able to see him kick an Indy. And uh, there was a group of about seven coaches, I think, maybe that went to Florida that that one time to watch him kick. And again, it was different back in 21. You could only watch him one time. You couldn't go to have private workouts. It was just one pro day. And, and so there's a group of us that, that uh, watched him kick. And I was super, super impressed by him. Um, and in fact, Shane Graham was was a special teams analyst at Florida at the time. And he had kind of tipped me off to him, you know, uh, a, a period of time before that, that, hey, we got a hell of a kicker down here. You need to look at it. So. Again, I've been very fortunate to be around, just like I talked about, you know, good organization. I've been fortunate to be around good players in that regard, too. So, um, course, again, just it, lucky. Yeah, it helps to have an eye. I mean, uh, McPherson, nine kicks of 50 yards or more during his rookie campaign in 2021. Absolutely phenomenal. And the toughness of, of you know, of Kevin Huber, I remember him taking a shot against Pittsburgh, broke his oh. jaw. You oh. and I both know that would run most punters out of the game. So, this guy comes back and he's playing with a wired jaw and still goes on to have a long career. I thought it was exceptional and I thought it showed an exceptional level of toughness. Oh my God. I, I, I remember that play very, very vividly. Um, when, when he got hit, um, he got hit right in the face, right in the jaw, as you explained. And he's laying, he's laying down face first in the turf and didn't move. And I thought, Oh my God, he's knocked out cold. He, he might be dead. Um, and so our trainer went running out there, Paul Sparling went running out there to check on him and, uh, he touched him and he, and Paul just started yelling to the doctors, like, he's out, he's out, he's out. And Kevin, you know, stopped and said, no, I'm not, I'm fine. Wow. It was my, my mouth. I, I just can't roll over on my stomach cause I'm, I'm bleeding all over the place. My mouth's full of blood and I, I can't, I'm going to choke on my own blood if I roll over. So wow. for him to take that hit and, and not be knocked out. And, uh, uh, you know, them just stuff a bunch of gauze in his mouth to keep him from bleeding. It's 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 incredible. Um, the, the exactly as you described the level of toughness that he's got. So, well, you now have yourself a rookie punter in Brad Robbins. He led the NCAA in hang time. I think zero touchbacks with 43 punts. And I think for our listeners and viewers, that's very important. Kind of explain why he was such a jewel. And when you have that many punts, down deep in the opponent's territory, but none of them going out of the back of the end zone. Help them to understand why that's a real positive thing for any punter. Well, I, I think obviously the, the special teams, you know, 
phase that their special teams court. And my number one job is to help control field position. Yeah. And by whatever means that is, whether it's covering a kickoff, whether it's, uh, you know, us doing a good job in protection on a punt on a plus 50 play and, and the punter end up down on the ball. So obviously the longer field we can put their offense on, you know, you know the better, whether it's again, when we kick off or when we punt yeah. and uh, you know, being able to have the control that he has is a huge, huge weapon. Obviously he's very experienced in those, uh, uh, types of uh, conditions and plays haven't been at Michigan the last, uh, you know, well, really the su success they've had over the course of the last three years, you know, him being a, a big part of helping control them play great field position, um, you know, was a huge factor for us. Obviously his ability to get it up. That's the first thing that the first thing that really stuck out to me was his ability to hang the ball up in the air. You know, we got burned a couple of times late in the season uh, this past year, um, on, on some punts that we'd like to have back that were a little bit lower mm -hmm. than what we'd like. And you just expose your team. And and yeah. I think you have to, when you're in a position that, you, I, you know, I've, I've, we transitioned to a whole different time here in a, a different way that you win games. You know, there, there've been times here we tried to win games on defense and play good on special teams, play good on defense and, uh, not to take anything away from the personnel we've had before, but now we've got, we've got a quarterback in the offensive group that we've got now that can score points and can move the ball and and uh, are, are such dominant playmakers. We just don't want to screw it up for them, yeah. and you know. And, and so being able to control things that way and 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 not put ourselves in positions where we could have negative plays against us is a huge factor. And you know, the, his Brad's ability to hang the ball up uh, and and not expose your punt team to undue plays it was a, a big factor why he's here too. Yeah, there's so many quarterbacks in the AFC alone that if you yeah. give them the ball on a short field, man, it's as good as them already having three points. It's a matter yeah. of can you keep them out of the end zone? They're that yeah. good at this level. Talk to us about the new fair catch rule on, yeah. on kickoffs. Um, because I what I understand, all 32 special teams coaches voted against the rule, but yet NFL owners saw fit to institute that rule at least for one year what are your concerns about the rule? How do you think it impacts the game? Well, I, I just I just don't think it it uh, really uh, is a positive thing for the game. You know, and I'm all for, I'm, I'm going to start by saying I'm all for player safety. You, you yes. know, I'm, I'm all for keeping guys safe and, and eliminating things that could potentially you know hurt somebody's well being or, or ability to function even later in life. Not only now, but later in life. I'm yeah. I'm all for that. I want to eliminate. And I was a part of this group of about eight or nine special teams coaches that dated back in 2018 where, you know, there was a significant number of concussions on kickoff. So we did things like we eliminated the wedge. I mean, there used yes. to be, as you, as you know, back in, in your playing days, and hell, there used to be a five-man wedge. It was That's just right. like a, a, a Mack truck and, and, and guys were asked to go fit a crease and, and yeah. try to split the wedge and stop it. And, and, and those were offensive or defensive linemen. And you're just asking for guys to, to, you know, get injured in, anyway. Um, we eliminated all those things. We eliminated the the the, the areas of that we thought were dangerous. Um, the and the number consequently the numbers the concussion numbers went down. Um, you know, over the past two years that they bottomed out in 2020, I think, with 10. And we're talking about 10 concussions over the course of, a, of an entire season, yeah. which is a relatively you know again any concussion is, is you want to try to eliminate. Yeah. Um, but there was 10 in 2020. That bumped up a little bit in 2021. It took another little incremental increase in, in 2022. So um, the league uh, saw fit that they need to do something about it aggressively. Um, and, and again, back when we, we back when we evaluated these plays in 2018, we could identify, you know, where the injuries were occurring. It, it's, it's, yeah. it's occurring on hits. It's occurring on the wedge. It's according on it's they're, they're happening on trap blocks or happening on short sets. We could easily identify where they all these plays were happening. It was more difficult this time, frankly, to, to try to figure out ways to to eliminate some of this stuff. Some of it's going to be, in, as you know, it's going to be inherently uh, it's an inherent risk That's of playing right. football. That's right. We felt those coaches that um, we could affect a lot of these plays just in the way it's being coached. Yeah. Um, some of it, I think, is is uh, uh, quite frankly, it's it's poor technique by some of the players, you know, that are being asked to do some of these things. There are, um, you know, there's a, a higher majority of offensive players that this is happening to. And we're talking about guys who were tackling, you know, most of the injuries right. occurred on the kickoff team, not on the return team. So it's it's happening to players who are 
inexperienced doing the techniques that the things to do. It's it's an offensive player coming down and trying to make a tackle, and, and they they leave with their head or lower their head, lower which their is got to get out of the game. That's right. Um, so we felt like we could we could help affect that by coaching things a little better, coaching being more aggressive in the way that we coach these things and and practice the way we tech the, the way we tackle the way we block. Um, the league didn't uh, necessarily feel that way, so uh, they they tried to implement this. Or they're going to what we did. We're not trying to. We're implementing this fair catch rule. And there's there's a couple of factors that we were concerned about as coaches. Um, n- number one, we felt like that uh, uh, there could be actually an uptick in the number of turns. Like mm-hmm. if if I'm a coach and I feel like that my kickoff team matches up pretty well against a kickoff return team, meaning we have better speed, we may have better, uh, you know, better athletes that can wiggle and, and come down and make plays. And I, if I think that you're, you as a, an opposing team are going to fair catch it, then why not for us? Why would we just pop the kickoff up and force you to have to execute the catch? That's right. Okay. Meaning what most people don't understand on this rule is if the returner signals fair catch and happens to muff it, okay, it is the and he then subsequently recovers it. It's the offensive ball at the spot of the muff. Mm. So if if we hit a popped up kickoff or any type of kickoff to the let's say the four yard line, the returner signals fair catch and drops it and muffs it. It's the offensive ball first and ten at the four. At the four. Wow. Okay. So they don't you don't get the ability to you know pick that ball up and run with it even though they didn't handle it cleanly and and. So I think what we're going to be potentially exposing ourselves to is, is potentially a variety of different kicks, you know, maybe some line drives, maybe some more squibs to prevent the, the opponent from fair catching it. Um, and, you know, it, but it was like I was saying earlier, what's the difference between us, you know, Evan hitting Evan McPherson hitting the ball seven yards deep in the end zone for a touchback yeah. versus playing a team we know is going to try to signal fair catch. Why would we tell him to pop it up and force the returner to execute the fair catch when the result's going to be the same? And then on a um, bad weather day, um, it, you almost want to force them to have to handle the ball yeah, because if correct. they mishandle it in any way, advantage goes to the kicking team. Correct. And then, you know, the, the flip side of that too is I, I think most people and, and most people that attend games, I don't know that, that it really shows up on TV much, but Right now, there's kind of a gentleman's agreement in, in amongst the coaches in the league that if the ball is going to be hit in the end zone for a touchback, people probably don't aren't aware, but you'll see the returner stick his hands up like this. And that we, we call that the iron cross. Mm-hmm. And that's he's signaling to everyone that, hey, I'm not going to bring the ball out. You can shut it down. So that's right. sometimes the cover team is running down. If they see the if they see the returner stick his hands out like that, they know he's stopped and he's not going to return it. And the blockers are the same way. The blockers, they turn and run and begin to drop. If they see the returner signal this, they don't, they can stop them. They do not have to block. Don't touch anybody. Just stay away from contact. That's completely different, though, if the ball is signaled fair caught. That means the ball is in the field to play. So there's yeah. always the opportunity potential for a muff. So even though somebody signals fair catch, I can't tell the cover players to stop covering. I can't tell the blockers to stop blocking. So there's yeah. still going to be that contact that occurs because if the ball is muffed, that ball's live can, can yeah. be recovered by the kicking team. So, you know, the continuation of that, there's still going to be contact to some form or fashion. We're not going to be, what we're going to eliminate is hits on the returner. When, when right. we signal fair catch and if it's That's executed right. correctly, we're going to eliminate hits on the returner. So there's just some, some uh, parts to the, to the play that, um, oh, that uh, a lot of the coaches, including myself, weren't a big fan of that. Um, I think there's some other alternatives that mm-hmm. uh, um, could come into play here in the future. Thankfully, this is only going to be for one year, and, and I, I think maybe there may be some better alternatives. As we get a little more time to to research this a bit. I think that there may be some better alternatives. Yeah, uh, very great uh, and good explanations there. There's no doubt about it. And showing some of the nuance uh, behind the ruling and showing us at least what we could expect. I think there are some of those yeah. things that could – that could really pop up over the course of a long yeah. NFL season. Look, when it comes to specialists, whether it's the punter, the kicker, uh, the snappers, or even the return guys, kind of help us to understand how you pull it all together to make it work. Because we're talking to a lot of people on the football team that you've got to pull into your meetings and, mm-hmm. and get them to buy in in order to make the special teams units work. Well, a lot of that, a lot of that, I think, comes from the background where they've where they've played before, you know, in some of their college programs where it's been important. 
Um, you know, I, I try to stress to these guys that, that when they walk in the door, there's 90 players on our roster now, but we've got to whittle this down to 53. And really the 53 man roster means nothing to me. It's the 48 man roster. It's the active roster on game day that matters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way that works is, you know, numbers have kind of changed around a little bit with the way the defenses have, have changed their basic alignments. Like, you know, everybody's really base defense now is nickel with, with, with uh, five DBs on the field and two linebackers and four defensive linemen, what have you, um, you know, or what, whatever type of front you want to use. So we, we've, we've seen an uptick in the number of DBs. So a lot of teams will carry nine or 10 DBs into a game. Five of those are, are really going to be your starters. And I, I really count the nickel as one of those starters. So you're really, really probably going to have five backup DBs. You're, we're looking at probably two or three corners made up by two or three corners and, and maybe a couple safeties. And then, you know, more than likely, if you carry five linebackers, you're going to have two starters and, and uh, you know, maybe three backups. And we're going to carry, let's say, three tight ends. Well, we're going to have one, one starter, one that plays a lot, the second one that plays a lot, and then the third one's going to be involved in the kicking game. And, you know, we have one starting running back. We're probably going to carry three on the active roster, 48-man uh, roster. So I'm, I'm going to have two. They're going to be, you know, big-time role players for us. And, and so I love telling receivers, and we drafted a couple of them this year. I mean, and we, we drafted Charlie Jones, and, yeah. and we drafted uh, uh, Isavias, the kid from Princeton. And, you know, one of the first things that uh, – uh, the first meetings I, I, I talked with these guys about, I said, guys, let's have no grand illusions of what your role is going to be on this team, okay? Yeah. The, the only chance, the only chance that you have to play right now is to play with me and be, and be a, a – a dominant player on special teams. Cause who are you going to take? You can take reps from Jamar chase. You're going to take, you're going to take plays from T Higgins or Tyler Boyd. It ain't going to happen. It ain't happening. It ain't, <laughs> ain't, happen. it, right. it ain't going to work that way. Or if you're a running back, you think you're going to take plays away from Joe Mixon. No, it ain't happening. No. <laughs> so you better learn to find That's a right. role with me. And I, I said, don't wait until it's too late. You need to start. You need to be a dominant player with this stuff. Now don't come to me. In the, at, at the end of the second preseason game, we start cutting people and you realize, oh, man, I'm next. And then all of a sudden want to be want to be buddies with me or want to be, you know, <laughs> really, really want to be all in. And then it's too late. Yeah, yeah. The, the bus is already halfway. You know, the bus is already pulling out a lot right now with, with a, a lot of them. So, you know, I, I think it, it, it comes from, you know, really me helping these guys understand how that they make this team and how that they um, contribute here, it, it, you know. Once they're here and once we've drafted them, whether whether they're a draft pick or the college free agent, it really doesn't matter. Once they get here, it doesn't matter. What matters now is what they do when they get here. We've had we've got a, a good track record here of, of uh, college free agents making it and, and, and becoming dominant you know players for us. And yeah. and uh, you know we, we've had a lot of guys go through that and have really become good special teams players. So um, I'm pleased. I'm, I'm proud to be a part of that. We've got a good tradition here and, and, uh, you know, it's up to the, to the veteran players to, to make these young guys also help understand that. A couple of more questions for you because Charlie Jones is a guy that when I put the tape and I watched this guy, when, wherever he gets the ball, whether it's that wide receiver as a punt return guy, kick return yeah. guy, he seems to be a home run hitter. So I would have to imagine it wasn't a tough sell for him. What is it about his game and his overall skill set? That makes him a really great candidate for special teams. Well, I, I, I think he is his past history. He, he didn't have a great senior year in terms of being a dominant specialist, but you know he, he started off at Buffalo University of Buffalo. Then he transferred to the University of Iowa. I mean, he was he ended up being a the Big Ten Special Teams Player of the Year. But you know, it, it, it's not a secret. Iowa doesn't didn't do a great job. They weren't a dynamic offense. It really relied on the passing game and the receiver. So I, I think he knew he was a solid and good returner, but he wanted to expand his game and, and, you know, get some more chips on his side. So he transfers to Purdue where he knows they're going to throw the ball and he ends up, you know, leading the country in catches. So, I mean, it's a hell of a smart decision by him. Yeah. Um, but what, what really sticks out with me is, his, is uh, A, is his judgment. He does a good job of uh, uh, knowing when to fair catch, when not to fair catch, when to handle the ball. He, he's a good decision maker. Um, he really handles the ball well. He, he's, he's got good hands. He gets himself in good position to catch the ball. And, that, and that's the, a, a couple of the, the biggest factors, I think, is we, we've got to be able to possess the ball. I, I don't yeah. care how dynamic of a runner you are with the ball in your hands. I mean, you got to have the ball in your hands first. So right. um, they've got to be able to catch. And, and then the, the other thing that really sticks out to me is his quickness, his quickness and cutting ability. You know, he, he's lost a little weight. He, uh, uh, when he was at Iowa, he's like 190 pounds. He's not quite that much now. Um, 
but I, I think it's made him quicker and faster. And, and he's, you know, he's, uh, um, you know, got, got really good elusiveness. So I, I'm very excited to see what he can do in the preseason for us and see how he can help us. So it, it'll, it'll be, a, he'll be a fun one to watch. Last one for you before we let you go. Uh, we got a lot of young kids, high school kids. Everyone wants to be the star at their position. And mm -hmm. as you said, when you come into the NFL, you got to be able to do other things. The more things you can do to contribute to the success of the team, the more likely you get to stay. So help help us to understand what are you looking for when it comes to the coverage units, guys mm -hmm. who are running down on punts, guys who are running down on kickoffs. What are some of the traits that you really look for? Well, I, I think the first one is desire and toughness, and that's the, those are are two things that that are difficult for me to control, and, and they either have it or they don't. I mean, one good example I'll use is uh, you know a lot of people don't know we on our roster right now have the leading receiver, the most prolific receiver at the University of Nebraska, okay? and nobody can name him, but his name is Stanley Morgan. That's right. Okay? That's right. And, and, uh, and he's a dominant, and that just kind of goes to show you how how well Nebraska has thrown the ball th throughout <laughs> throughout time, but. But Stanley is a hell of a special teams player, and and he and he's he's not afraid to go in there and like you say do the all the dirty things. And but but I do think the, the number one thing you have to have is is uh, desire and toughness. And then uh, you know when we make a lot of picks late in the draft, we make a lot of picks based on height, weight, speed, because some of these players, some of these guys coming out of college, don't have a ton of playing experience you know, on special teams because they're such dominant or important roles offensively and defensively. The coaches don't want to risk exposing them, uh, you know, on special teams. But now those roles have kind of changed. It's kind of like they go back to being a freshman again in college or a freshman yeah. in high school. You know, when they have the freshmen, the sophomores playing on special teams until they kind of become better players and, and more experienced players and, and yeah. learn to find a greater role in offense and defense. It's kind of like they graduate to the varsity. Um so I'm dealing with a lot of the underclassmen, if you want to, if you want to put it that way. And but I and I explained it as such. We've had a lot of guys that have, have come in here and and yeah. and been really really good special teams players that have expanded their role because they've made plays, expanded their role and and really uh, uh, you know ran that off into to being really good offensive defensive players. We had one you know off the top of my head, we had a receiver here named Kevin Walter. That's um, right. Kevin Walter, we had it was was drafted by the Giants and. And then he came here and, and he played well for us. He's a receiver yeah. um, who had never played much on special teams, but he's really smart and he's really tough and he was really fast. And he did a, he, he did a hell of a job playing gunner for us. And, and the, the better he played on, on special teams, it, he, he established his role and the more of an opportunity he got on offense and defense That's right. or on offense. And then yeah. he ended up translating that into a big contract in Houston and, and uh, that's the way you want it to work. And, and Vinny Ray is another great example of that. That's I mean, right. Vinny's a, a, a linebacker for us. We had here as a college. He didn't get drafted, but he could run. And, and he was tough. He was physical. And, uh, you know, he started off. He didn't make the, the roster here initially. Um, he was on our practice squad. And he just kept learning. He kept preparing. He had a guy in, in by Dahani Jones was his mentor. That's right. And Dahani, you know, really, really was a, a great leader and showed Vinny the way of how to be a pro and and how to do all the little things that it took to to get ahead and stay ahead. And, and Vinny just kept improving as a special teams player. And then he, he had an opportunity to become an offensive or a defensive player as a starting linebacker for us yeah. and then took off from there. Most people don't know that, you know, when we had Vontez Burfick, Vontez Burfick came here as a college free agent. He was undrafted. That's right. And That's right. The first half of his rookie season, he was about as dominant on special teams as anybody in the league as a rookie because he had he had enough. I mean, everybody knows that he was physical. That's right. Um, what most people don't know is how intelligent a football player he really was. He he His ability to understand the game, understand angles, understand schemes – was as good as anyone has ever been. And then he got an opportunity. We had an injury at, uh, I think, uh, Thomas Howard got hurt and Vontez became a starter. And then, you know, it, it took off from there. So, you know, th these guys, they got to they gotta be physical. They got to be tough. They got to be able to run and, and understand what their role is going to be. And then hopefully they graduate on and go on to, to bigger and better things. And I just kind of hit reset and come in with a new flock of guys again and, and go. I, I tell people all the time, even the great Terrell Davis became a Pro Bowl yeah. or Hall yeah. of Fame running back, I should say, by first run, demonstrating what he could do on special teams, yeah. running down, making a tackle on the kickoff. And I think it's a testament uh, to coaches like yourself that you're able to get a guy like Vontez Burford or a guy like Kevin Walter or Vinnie Ray 
to buy in, right? Yeah. They're the number 40, 45, 46, 47th yeah. guy on the roster. You got to be able to get them to buy in, and it yeah. makes the entire team better, doesn't it? Oh, for sure. I mean, because you, you know, it, it, I got a couple other examples. I can, I, I got a bunch, but, you know, we had, when we drafted, uh, we drafted Drake or Patrick in the first round, who was not an immediate starter for us. Then we drafted Darquez Denard, not immediate starter for us. Yeah. We led the NFL in punt coverage because of those two players were our gunners. So, I mean, we had two first round <laughs> picks. At two first I mean, round picks. Yeah. yeah. You don't ever, you don't, as a special team coach, <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. Yeah. I mean, let, 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 let's keep these guys doing what they're doing here for a little bit longer. Um, but, but it's an easy sell when, when, when they have ability when, when they have physical ability and physical talent, that's an easy sell. It, it's the guys though, that are the fringe guys. It's player number, like you stated, 52 or 53 on your roster that like, Hey bud, you know, you just got to understand where your value is and, and what's going to butter your bread here. And, and if you're player number 53 and, and we have an injury at another position, you know, where they're going. That's they're, right. Where they're going to lop somebody off to have to replace you. So don't be player 52. Don't be player 50. Don't be player 51. Be that's player right. 46, 47, 48. If that's the, if that's the end of the line for you, but be, be one of those guys who's going to be on the active roster. Don't be on those five who, who are inactive all the time. That's be right. somebody who has a role, make yourself valuable and find your niche. It's, it's like anything. It, 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 when players can find their niche and, and, and show some type of value to a team, then it's worth its weight in gold. I always say you got to be special to be on the special teams. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. You got to have that something special. I think you talked about it, that desire, that determination. Yeah. Um, that's what makes, I think, amongst some of the best special teams players that we've seen. Darren, thank you for taking the time to join us. I know our viewers are going to enjoy this conversation and learn something about the game. We appreciate you, and thanks again. Well, thanks for having me on. I enjoy doing this stuff. I don't get, you know, we don't get to do this kind of stuff a lot. And I, I always enjoy doing it, especially with somebody like you. Mr. amount of respect for what you do. Bring to this oh, game. Appreciate you. We respect what you do. Keep up the great work. 21st season coming up with the Cincinnati Bengals. Man, that's that's putting in work. And you didn't even have to move around a lot, right? <laughs> no, well, I got three kids. I got three kids and a wife to thank us for the, to thank the Brown family for that. <laughs> <laughs> All the best to you. Thanks, Darren.